we're we're the Pangburn Hangout. Travis Pangburn is our leader. He get he gets public intellectuals to speak, you know, and get together and go to conferences and things like that. And uh, he's been getting us a lot of good guests, including you and including Lawrence Krauss and um, all these other cognitive psychologists like Donald Hoffman and things like that who I've talked to. Uh, it's just a privilege, and I chose your name off one of the lists because I was like, oh, cognitive psychology. <laughs> But no, um, can I can I introduce you real quick to the to the audience? Would that be okay? Uh, sure. I, I don't know who the audience is, but well, it's not too many people right now, and I'll tell you why. This this little program we're using, it's not finished yet. So what will happen is once we get done talking on here, I'll upload this video to YouTube. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. So. Uh, yeah, let me tell everybody who uh, Barbara is. I never, can I, may I ask you how you pronounce your last name? I, I answer to anything. It depends on what language you're speaking, but we, we usually you, we usually say Tversky in English. Tversky, okay. But yeah. I'm going to make sure that there's no extra noise here because I want it to my, be it, it, my, When we were all living together as a family and getting junk mail, we collected all the spellings we got of our name and there were 50 different spellings that came as junk mail to the <laughs> address. So, <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's weird. That's funny. Yeah, it's funny. <laughs> Um, so to our audience, Barbara is a cognitive psychologist and professor of psychology at Columbia University. She has made significant contributions to the field of cognitive psychology, and her research focuses on spatial cognition, language and thought, and memory. Uh, she is known for her work on mental models, which are mental representations of real or hypothetical situations. She's also conducted research on spatial reasoning, including studies on how people mentally represent and navigate through physical spaces. So she's, this is the kind of stuff I want to talk about. You know what I mean? Like I have a lot of good questions for you, but I don't know what's more comfortable for you. Would you like me to just ask you what you're doing here recently? What have you been focused on? I can start with that. Um, I wrote a book that came out. It's now four years, but I'm still getting nice responses to it in which I argued that spatial thinking is the foundation of all thought. And I brought arguments from the brain um, and from language. There are a lot, many of the ways we talk about everything else are spatial. We say somebody's feeling up or down in a depression. We say these concepts are far apart or close together. So we're using spatial ways of thinking in understanding abstract things and that it also get, gets expressed in language, but also in gesture, as I did now. Um, the, so I'm interested in how we think about space and how we use space to think. Mm. And it includes not just our bodies and our language, um, and our thinking, but it also includes the things we make, the things that are in space, and the things that we make in space to Im improve our own thinking, like diagrams, like models, um, and so forth. So that's a broad overview, but yeah. it, 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 it takes us many places, and again, it's that's a spatial way of talking, taking us to many Taking places. us to many places, taking us in that direction, right? Right. Another exactly. way of spatial, yeah. Exactly. So spatial, spatial reasoning seems to be intrinsically important to like almost the philosophy of space and time to me. And I, I'm a physics nerd, so I always bring things back to, to metaphysics and physics. But um, let's, let me go to one of my good questions because I had a lot of good ones written down here. So let's talk about... Let's talk about mental models. Can we explain that to people in a way that's that's colloquially understandable? I I think I can. Um, when okay. we hear something complicated, like a set of directions to get from A to B, or how to fix something, 
or how something works, we set up in our minds a representation of the way we understand what's being said. So it's a kind of summary, but it's also a model. And it's a model in an abstract sense, but often in a spatial sense. So we can sketch it out. And we see those kinds of sketches and models in textbooks and newspapers. Mm -hmm. And we gesture them, even things like on the one hand, on the other, where we're setting up a contrast. Mm -hmm. So a mental model would be a mental representation of a set of ideas that summarizes mm -hmm. and integrates those ideas. Yeah. And Does so, that... oh, oh, yeah, that answer, that's perfect. <laughs> that's absolutely perfect. Um, so with, you know, with these mental models and the spatial reasoning and the re relationship between all of this and language and thought, what is most fascinating about what you're trying to achieve to, re to uh, relate all this together? Well, arguing, it's not an easy question. <laughs> arguing that spatial thinking is the foundation of thought and okay. that all creatures need to move in space, even one-celled organisms need to move in space so that moving in space is primary to life. When motion stops, life ends. So we need to be able to keep track of space. We need to be able to know what to approach and what to avoid. So the first act in space is whether you're going towards something or away from it. And that act in space is replete with emotion. Mm. From the get-go, we approach mm. things that are attractive, that we like, that we're um, not afraid of. We avoid things that might be noxious or fearful or for whatever reason, we want to move farther away from them. So even that first act in space has an emotional weight to it. That's and funny. again... Simple amoebae, amoeba, um, even viruses have to move mm -hmm. in space, and they are a, an odd life form that is most of the time not alive. They have to invade a cell to be alive, right. and that's the act they need um, is to that's enter so, a cell. That's so interesting the way that you put that. Um, <clears throat> so I, we can talk about more about the special so you said special reasoning is like the top category of what you're thinking about or are you thinking about it how, how well, I, like I don't know i don't know what's the top here but it, it's again a special i mean i yeah. talk about it as a foundation which would be the, that's the that's i guess more of what i mean and, that that would... and from there you can get to abstractions and usually we think about abstractions as up and concrete mm -hmm. things is down, but um, it, we can reverse that easily. It is, it, we, well, amongst other things, we bring a, a variety of evidence that this vertical axis is loaded. And on the whole, good things go up, okay? So somebody's at the top of the class, somebody's feeling up, somebody gets a high score, Good things on the heaven is up. Um, right. So on the whole, good things are up and bad things are down. Even We see it even in our posture. When we're feeling good, we stand tall. And when okay. we're feeling lousy or tired, we don't have the energy to stand tall. So we slump, even lie down. So that vertical axis is loaded and on the whole good things go up. Now the economists sort of violate that because inflation goes up, yeah. unemployment goes up. And I always kid that uh, economists are perverse. <laughs> and, and in some ways they are by thinking that money is the major goal of people. And I take strong, um, I strongly resist that argument with good evidence. And um, 
but it, the reason they plot unemployment and inflation going upward is because of the numbers. The numbers go up. So when you have a conflict between a concept and numbers, you have to decide which goes up. And atmospheric scientists do the opposite, but numbers, if you're in a science or in a data business, then numbers trump and numbers go up. So even bad things like incidence of disease can go up just because of the numbers. So we argue the vertical is loaded, and that seems to be the case in all of the languages that I'm familiar with and that my audiences are familiar with. Nobody's come up with a counter, but the horizontal is neutral. Mm. Um, all because there isn't anything like gravity in the environment. So in order to go up, you need resources. You need health, strength, power. That's why some people build high buildings because it takes, <laughs> it's a show of power. Oh, and yeah. In parts of Italy are filled with uh, towers that went up and were built in the Middle Ages. They have no function whatsoever except to show you can build high. Uh, so it takes resources to go up and age, small children, large adults. So I think that's the reason for the, the fact that good things go up in our mind. Yeah. But there's no asymmetry in the horizontal. Um, mm. no, no body asymmetry. Our bodies are somewhat asymmetric, but on the whole pretty symmetric. Our bodies up down are certainly asymmetric, and again we have gravity. But there's nothing comparable in the horizontal world. But cultural, um, cultural things play a role in horizontal. So gotcha. languages that go m many of the languages we speak, like European. Oh, language. I see exactly what you're saying. Like left, right in cultures and things like that. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Got yeah. you completely now. Got you. So, and, and on the whole, people who read left to right languages also order numbers that way and tend to order um, all kinds of things from left to right. So there's an association of left being primary and first, and that reverses to some extent in right to left languages. So by now there is a cottage industry of people studying the effects of reading and writing on these sorts of, and arithmetic, because they mm. there are cultures that read right to left, but do numbers left to right. Really? It's, yeah, a Hebrew would be one of them, and eventually Arabic. Um, I don't know about Urdu, um, mm. and I don't know about early Chinese and or pre twenty first century Chinese and Japanese that were written in columns, but then went right to left. So, but in any case, there are a number of people who are studying the effects of reading and writing on, on our cognition. Also the body, when you mentioned left and right, and left and right um, affect our judgments of value, but not abstract judgments. Um, and that probably has to do with most of the world being right-handed and only a minority being left-handed. and in some of those cultures that write, um, write that in some of cultures, children who write f with their left hands are forced to write with their right. Mm. I think this is no longer practiced, but for a long time it was. Let's hope not. <laughs> so That's... the body does influence those concepts. But yeah. the left right is mostly value, not other abstract. Right. So, so we see very simple things. The, the, the world with gravity, 
and it being asymmetric in our bodies that are asymmetric or symmetric, those influence our thinking and the way we set up dimensions in our mind. That's such a beautiful metaphor. I'm trying to imagine it all in this like abstract, in this abstract virtual space I've got in my mind, and I'm kind of piecing everything you're saying together in the up, the the up down scale and the horizontal scale and symmetry and asymmetry. It's all it's a beautiful model mental model I have going on of my own right now. Um, so I guess we could jump to uh, the importance of visual thinking and problem solving and creativity. How, how would you how would you think about that? So that there, I mean, it's a long story too. Um, what's interest? One of the things that's interesting about visual thinking or spa, visual thinking and spatial thinking are different. Right. Okay. So we think about visual thinking as being able to imagine objects or faces or things in the world, how mm-hmm. they look. Spatial thinking is something blind people can do. Right, with their feeling of touch or smell or proprioception. Or, or, they yeah. orient in space, they walk in space, they mm-hmm. move their hands in space, mm-hmm. and they can use space to think about abstractions yeah. um, easily. I once had a blind student or nearly blind student in my class, and I was teaching learning curves. And she couldn't see the graphs, of course, and didn't understand what I was saying. So I took her hand and moved it this way and said, this is time. Uh, And this axis is how good, how much you're learning. And a learning curve goes like, well, do it the wrong way. A learning curve (laughs) goes like that, upward, and then flattens out. And I took her hand and did that. And the light went off, and she oh. you could see she suddenly got the concept because she could easily think spatially, even if she couldn't see the graphs. So the, it's it's a common confusion. People confuse spatial and and visual, and of course, space helps us orient when we're walking around the world. But blind people can have very good mental maps or mental representation or mental models of the worlds they navigate. And oh, yeah. you can describe those worlds to them and they'll set up a mental model that they can use. So, and it would can, just be the blind mental model, right? Yeah, or it would be it their would, version, their version of the blind mental well, It would be spatial, just like ours. And yeah. if you did refine tests of what is closer to what, what's north of what, what's south of what, what's e- mm. if you ask them those things after giving them a description, they'll answer the same way anyone who's sighted will. So, okay. in fact, many of them are better because they can't rely on sight. They use, I mean, we all use landmarks when we're navigating, and they use different kinds of landmarks. So they'll use how the pavement feels on their feet, and they'll use the sounds they hear, the smells, the wind. And I now find myself walking around New York and paying attention to those things and knowing is somewhat where I am by all of a sudden there's a wind, so I know there's an an open field nearby that would generate wind, um, or the smells of a pizza place or a bakery, and I can anticipate what's coming next. So blind people will use different landmarks, but they'll navigate much the same way as we do. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's beautiful. Um, That kind of goes right into my next question, because I was going to say in your book, uh, Mind in Motion, you actually discuss the importance of of physical movement and embodiment in thinking and learning, right? Right. And some of that work goes back to rats. There was lovely work on brain and rats and showing that you can take a rat and put electrodes in its head 
that are tapping into single neurons. And this is work that was done 50 years ago. It's astounding work to me. The rats don't notice it. They're wandering around. But the neuroscientists can see when a single cell fires. And uh, people working with John O'Keefe and Lynn Nadell years ago in the 70s found that there were single neurons in rat hippocampus that fired when the rat was in a particular place. So that's memory, right? Uh, absolutely. It's memory right. and it's coding those places by single neurons. But mm. those neurons weren't arrayed spatially. And in, in, in the Mosiers, work, who were postdocs in, in O'Keefe's lab, discovered one synapse away in entorhinal cortex, right next door to the hippocampus, they discovered what they called grid cells that okay. map the place cells in a spatial array. Oh, okay. So it's like okay. a map, it's approximate, things are not metric. Are the neurons, I hate to interrupt you, are the neurons actually arranging themselves in a pattern of a map or is it more like yes. a virtual? Yes. They are, okay. okay. Yes, that's what's astounding, is that the is neurons astounding. were in the pattern of a map. Oh, and man. that it was terribly exciting. They won the Nobel Prize for that work. And since then, you know, I used to get frustrated. I got into spatial cognition as a contrarian because people <laughs> were thinking that all thinking is language. And I said, wait a minute, babies no, not, think, yeah. animals think they don't have yeah. language. An awful lot of thinking isn't language. So I got into this by being a contrarian. But the, until the work of the Mosiers and, and Nadell and, and O'Keefe, there wasn't much brain work on spatial thinking, but after the discovery of the grid cells and the place cells, it just exploded. So now there's a huge amount. And what's more, some of that work is showing that we map abstract concepts onto the grid cells. So the place cells don't just pick up places in people, they also pick up events in time and people, social relations, and those get mapped on the grid cells, the social relations, the temporal relations, the conceptual relations get mapped on the grid cells. So oh. that, that is, uh, I think, strong evidence that spatial thinking is the foundation of all thought, that the same brain structures that code places and spatial arrays also code people, concepts, and time, events in time, and their relations in the grid cells. Are the grid cells throughout the entire, um, what, what area did you say they were from? Is there, right from? next, they're one synapse away from um, from the hippocampus. Okay. So the hippocampus is buried way inside our skulls mm -hmm. and inside our brains and entorhinal cortex surrounds it. And that's where the grid cells are. Now, gotcha. of course, there are projections all over the cortex. Nothing is as simple as I've said. Right. So things get um, distributed in, in many ways over the cortex represented in many places, but interestingly, I mean, the hippocampus is a very sensitive part of the brain and alcoholism destroys it. It goes, it, the trauma can affect it. Um, PTSD, childhood trauma can affect it. It Absolutely. seems to be important for in humans for not just spatial memories, but for temporal memories, for memory for events, it's important. And the hippocampus itself sends, it has connections all over the brain, so it can connect yeah. people to places and people to each other and ideas to each other. It's also a part of the brain that goes fairly early on in aging. 
Mm -hmm. this is that's, a, that's where people with Alzheimer's and dementia and things like that are going to have problems because of the memory. And, and normal aging as well. And that's why um, people who age, it's not a good idea to put them in brand new environments. Because it's harder for them to learn them and they get disoriented. And when you're disoriented, you get frightened yep. when you don't know where you are. So it, it's, um, it's important to know in dealing with aging. And if, you, yes. if someone is aging, to move before the, that kind of decline sets in. Well, I'll, I'll be honest with you, and if I, I can tell you something a little personal about my life, my grandmother is 91, and she is already in, she's already towards Alzheimer's. I mean, she can't hold a conversation, things like that, and she still lives by herself. You know what I mean? So I think about that all the time. You know, her, it's, it's damage in her hippocampus. Is it, Would I be correct in saying that? I mean, I know there's a lot more that goes on with Alzheimer's, but uh, well, just for my first yeah. I mean, there are many dementias. Alzheimer's is one of them. Okay. Um, and there's normal aging, that there's vascular dementia. And it's, it's hard to pinpoint where the damage is, and certainly not without a, a thorough examination by a neuroscientist. Mm -hmm. So, it, it, yeah. Well, I just thought I'd throw that out there. You don't have to feel pressured to answer. Thank you for hearing me out on that, though. Um, so let's talk about, let's talk about, uh, what do you see all of this evolving into in the, in the coming years? If people think more like you and, you know, you said you were the contrarian, well, what if people think more about spatial instead of just linguistics, you know, when it comes to learning or when it comes to, uh, thinking or anything, uh, you're right. A lot of people think about it linguistically, right? But it can't just be linguistics. We have, we exist in space, right? So what do you think if people uh, go more towards your view? What do you think is going to happen with that? Yeah, no, I mean, if there's more and more research on animals that is showing uh, really impressive feats of inference and intelligence, there are crows that have learned to throw nuts onto the street when it's a red light because they've learned that the cars will then trample the nuts and open them for the crows. So the wow. crows have figured that out. There are more and more feats of cleverness that, mm -hmm. that birds and other animals do. Anyone who's raised a baby knows what wonderful things, inferences they can make without, um, without having language. And and uh, parents of children or grandparents or uncles or friends also know when babies start talking it, it, and you can't wait, all of a sudden everything begins with B, bottle, mm -hmm. bus, banana, and mm -hmm. it always sounds like ba. And, uh, and whatever <laughs> they're saying, they're labeling the world. It isn't deep insights into how to balance the tower or or who's getting along with whom or who's related to whom and the yeah. sorts of things that babies know how to right. get things, how to get things out of places that don't know. they have i'm sorry to keep i keep doing this i keep interrupting i apologize don't they have a thing uh where they did test it may have been in the 90s where where they had toddlers who if you showed them you were bumping into a door and you know you couldn't get through the door they would come open the door for you i mean that's well, well it's before language like, yeah this yeah. is work on cooperation and uh, it's another interest of mine and something we've been working on and if you this is my my fight with the economists they emphasize competition and think we're all competing with each other and evolution gives you that impression as well but what made human beings successful, because we're not faster or stronger than the things in the world that would be happy to eat us, um, it, it, tigers and lions and all kinds of creatures are faster and stronger than we are. What gives us an evolutionary advantage is we work together. 
we cooperate. And that's the only, that's the secret of our success, as Joseph Henry put it. But is someone who called great attention to that. Of, I'm a fan of, as you all know, Harari and his book, Sapiens, which I recommend to everyone. So that the basis of cooperation happens in early childhood. So the child will say, but, and the adult says, but, and the child says, but, and the adult says, but, and then maybe the adult will say, but, but. And then the kid will say, Baba. So it sets up an interaction, a kind, it's the basis of conversation. We each contribute in alternation. It's fun for the child. It's fun for the adult. The contributions are very small. They fit into a child's working memory. As the child grows older, the contributions get bigger turns yeah. into clapping games mm -hmm. that again you do where the routines get longer it turns into games like rolling a ball so yeah. i roll the ball to you or to the baby and the baby doesn't want to roll it back to me the baby wants to keep it but yeah. i induce the baby to roll it back to me and then i give it back to the baby so that establishes trust yeah that I'm going to give you, I'm going to wait a minute and I'm going to give that to you and we'll go back and forth. So we've established a, con a conversation, a routine where each contributes and we've established trust. Mm -hmm. And when you t raise dogs, you do the same. You have to yeah. establish trust that gratification might be delayed, but it will come. And that's that those games, which are games and they're fun, set up the basis for cooperation for the entire life. Yeah. The, the baby and the caretaker or the older child are practicing that. And it's again, it's in a game. Yeah. And that so and that's nonverbal. It is. It, yeah. None of that is verbal, and the kid has learned a lot, and the elder has learned a lot. It sets up the basis for learning language, that kind of trust. It sets up the basis for helping each other. So this, this anecdote that you um, told is work of Tomasello, Michael Tomasello, who was um, in Leipzig at uh, Max Planck. He's now either at at Duke or at Emory, I can't remember. He's been at both. And he studied cooperation in apes, monkeys, and small children. And you can get monkeys and apes to cooperate a bit, not to the depth that children do, but children two, three years are cooperating. They have a sense of fairness. If one of them gets to more reward than the other, they'll share. And the particular story that you told is a video that Tomasello shows that's yep. very engaging. Yep. And in it, there's an adult with a huge stack of papers yes. walking toward a closet. And yes. this child who is not speaking, he's barely walking, um, sees the adult come into the closet and opens the door of the closet. Yeah because the child makes the inference that the adult wants to put the papers in the closet, that the adult can't open the closet because his hands are holding the papers, so the child opens the door. Yeah. So this is unrewarded co cooperation. Maybe the adult will say thank you, but the child isn't doing it no. to get the thank you. The child no. is doing it because we're wired to help each other. Some some naturally wired altruism is what it seems like. I, yeah, it's, it's altruism. Yeah. It isn't. Oh. It doesn't cost the kid much. We're just wired to help. We are and, wired to help. I think so. Yeah, and and you know if it's if it's going to be a huge effort, we might not be able to do it. But, um, you know, I live in New York. If somebody drops a glove, there are four people chasing them to tell them they dropped a glove. <laughs> it's, um, 
I, I once was caught on the subway late at night and my vision isn't very good. I was walking up very dark stairs and I started to trip. And before I could, I was all set to catch myself. Before I could, there was a man on the left and a man on the right. They didn't know each other. They both lifted me up in the air and in unison. And, you know, it, it, it was just instinctive. It was split second on both their parts. And some people think that the, some people think that the world is built or that people are built on selfishness and cynicism, but I don't believe that. Right. I mean, when resources are scarce, yes. then then we fight. And right. then there's the issue of power and anticipated resources and taking from a, so there are, within people, there are good instincts and not so good instincts. And the trick really is, for, I mean, part of it is having enough resources. For some people, there's never enough. You know, I don't get it, but for some people, like, you know, you have a billion, you need more billions. For so what? But um, it, that's why you care so much about the economy. That's why you care about yeah. what the economists think. Well, it, it's a bit like building to high towers is to show you're more powerful. So that that's in us too. We're not one thing. There's a bubble, but the, there's a, a mixture of many, many different things that are stronger or weaker at different times and different people. But on the whole, people like to help. They like to be nice. They like um, to, to cooperate, they get a kick out of it, and having adequate resources certainly encourages that. That's awesome. I'm glad you told me that story about the cooperation and that you, you named it perfectly. That's, that's so nice that we can think about it that way because if you mirror your child correctly and there's no abuse and neglect or like you know excess admiration, then you're gonna get a cooperative little person. You know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, <laughs> on the whole, it should work. It should work, yeah. Yeah. Well, what I'll do, what I'll do is I'll ask you one more question, and then we can. Uh, I've got my friend in here. His name is Harry, and I very much would like to bring him up in just a moment. Get him on camera to meet you and uh, ask you a few questions. And then, if we have any callers, um, I'd like to maybe get their opinion just real quickly. Uh, how long do we have you for? Is is another twenty minutes okay, or do you need to go? I'm okay. Yeah. You're okay. Good. You can stay as long as you want. I just never want to take too much of people's time. Uh, the last question I have for you basically is, and this is this is what one of my friends would want me to ask you. You've explored the connections between art and science, right? And you argue that they both rely on visual thinking, spatial thinking. Uh, how how important is it in art and science? How important is it in art? Let's just say that. Well, it depends on the art, obviously. If you're doing visual or spatial art, it, it certainly helps um, to have good visual thinking. But even what about music? If, what about music? Well, so let me just finish on art. If visual thinking isn't unitary, just like verbal skills aren't unitary. There are people who can state things concisely with small number of words, but very clearly. There are people who write poetry with many obscure words connected in obscure ways. So there are a variety of spatial skills and a variety of visual skills. Kentridge, William Kentridge, South African artist, one of my favorites, says he can't work with color. And he makes absolutely amazing videos with charcoal. And, and they're wonderful. And I urge you to go on YouTube and find Kentridge videos. He's done operas. He does still, still work, but he can't work with color. And you look at some artists that are really good at landscapes. They're not so good at faces. So it, 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 there are a variety of visual skills that that go into making art and thinking about art they aren't unitary um as for creativity and for the kind of creativity that happens in science in many sciences again it's spatial you think about molecules and how they're constructed 
and so forth. Um, you think about the solar system. You think uh, there are many. You think about graphs that are graphing different sorts of things. So there are many ways that spatial thinking is important in science. But I have good friends who claim they can't think spatially at all. And I think they think linearly. A implies B implies C implies C, D. Yeah. And because I know I listen to them and that seems to be how they think, like linear logic. And probably the, the law has a lot of that kind of linear thinking where one thing implies another and philosophy can also have that kind of linear thinking. So it, 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 there's, you can be creative and think interesting thoughts and original thoughts even in this linear way. I think I'm a pretty spatial thinker and I don't, it's hard for me to conceive of that because anything, you know, I think about numbers spatially, I think about arithmetic or multiplication, it's spatial for me, but I know it isn't for other people, they think about it differently. So we have al algebraists and we have topologists and topology is it defies any three Euclidean um, yes. form of reasoning. So that's a very abstract way of thinking spatially. Yes. Everybody can do. So, I mean, when you get to art, science, even law, literature, there are many different skills that will make you creative and good at it. Um, I want to go back to a thread that you opened, which is about learning. Yes. And this has to do with gestures. And it, it, it's a lot. So most people gesture when they speak. Some people gesture when they're not speaking and it, or there's nobody there to see the gestures. And you, we see it all the time, people talking on their phones and they're gesturing like that. Yeah. It, it turns out the gestures come before the speech. And if you tell people to sit on their hands, they can't find words and they think more poorly. And the, especially for spatial things, people gesture, turn here, go there yeah. and so forth. And I've learned when I get lost in foreign countries and don't really know the language, I watch the hands. I think and, you speak very well with your hands. And I watch the hands even when I do understand the language because the language often leaves it out. Yes. Certain important things like curves and even turns they'll leave out. You just go straight. I once had someone tell me, but straight meant four turns. And they said go straight because they were always going straight. Their heads were always forward, but they were turning and didn't express that in language, but it was in their hands. And we found if we give, put people alone in a room and give them something complicated to learn, like how a car brake works or to study, and we describe it in words or we describe where certain landmarks in a, are in a town, and again in words. As they read, they're alone in a room, not talking. They make a model with their hands. So they'll make a model of the, the environment, where things are. They'll put points for places and lines for paths. And if they're doing something like how a car brake works and we say the brake fluid comes down and pushes out, they'll, they'll do this with their hands. Mm -hmm. And even though they're just reading. And when they do that, they perform better on the test. Mm. And if we make another group sit on their hands while they're um, studying these descriptions, they perform worse. And some of them say, I can't think without my hands. So that kind of gesturing of making a model, not just in your mind, 
but a spatial motor model with your hands helps you create one in your mind. And the, 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 for the most part, people aren't looking at their hands. No. So it's just the spatial motor action, not what they're seeing. So, okay. and it, it, there's been other work showing that the gestures that teachers make help the students learn. Yeah, and I can we, imagine that. We've done some of that work. So to describe, we, we have descriptions, verbal ones, of how a car engine works. But if the explainer uses gestures, say for the carburetor, or there's an explosion, um, the students in, incorporate the action much better than if the gestures show the structure mm. of things. So if for action, gestures are especially important. Mm. And we know that because after they've learned with the either the structure gestures or the action gestures, we ask them to, do, to make a movie explaining to somebody else. And those that saw the action gestures use more action words. They haven't heard more action words, but they use more action words. Okay, because they can abstract it easier because yeah, of the spatial. They, are, yeah. they understand the action. And yeah. they use way more action gestures, even for things that they didn't see. And the gestures they use aren't imitations mm. of what they saw. They're different. So it, 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 especially for action, um, using gestures when you teach. Um, so this might be scientific concepts. It might be things in literature that you're teaching in history. Troops are moving. But using action gestures um, will help your students learn or whoever's learning from you. Yeah. So those are things that are expressed in the body and interpreted by the body. Yeah. So and they're not language. Not language they're at all. Not words. They're like, you've you've kind of made me think on this, and I, I think I think you're right. The spatial aspect seems to be more fundamental. Um, this is all beautiful, and it's not just metaphor, but it is beautiful metaphor as well. Um, I was I was going to say I was going to ask you one more question. I'm not going to do that. Uh, Perry, are you with me, brother? Perry, hello. Yeah, do you, do you hear me? I'm on my PC. Yeah, I can hear you. Can you uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Um, okay. Go ahead, Perry. Good conversation. Um, wrote down a few things. So as Thomas said, we are physics and metaphysics nerds. Um, so space is a common time and space, of course, is a common topic for us. Um, we think and observe within this 3D realm. Um, and I'm assuming when you mention spatial reasoning, that is, I guess, the domain in which the spatialness is, is within this 3D aspect. Can we also use like a 2D or 4D or more to help us understand the internal and external world along with the 3D? So it, it, 2D is reasonably easy for people, although for some people it's a challenge. The retina is 2D, um, the grid cells are 2D. Thinking in three dimensions is hard for people. It, it, mathematicians get trained in it and get trained in the 4D. <laughs> but it's extremely difficult for, for people. Architects tend to, to um, design either the flat surface or an elevation. And it, it, it's partly because they're used for different purposes. So the plan, the horizontal, is how people move around and what things are where. And the elevation is usually either the facade or the internal walls where there's plumbing and electricity. Mm -hmm. So they serve different functions, but in product designers also find it difficult to design or think in 3D and they tend to use um, either a plan or an elevation. 
So thinking in 3D is difficult, and engineers that need to do it or architects that need to do it can be trained, but it doesn't transfer to another 3D domain. So mm -hmm. they're learning to think 3D within a domain, but it, it doesn't necessarily transfer. Interesting. And yeah, so 4D is... Really so 4D fun. is way out of the question then if we yeah. even have trouble with 3D. Yeah. There was um, a, a very gifted mathematician, Thomas Blanchford, and yep. he at, 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 um, at Brown, who developed a set of exercises for thinking in 3D, like a sugar cube on its vertex being dropped into a cup of coffee and was... There, when it hit the the surface of the coffee, how many vertices? Oh, okay. Yeah. So yeah. he had a whole set of exercises like that to get people into three D thinking, but even then, you tend to flatten things into two D. Yeah. So you hmm. think about the surface and the slice of the of the sugar cube, and I think it's four. But um, yeah, so it it, um, <laughs> it 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 you tend to flatten it, and it's, so, it, it seems like a sugar cube tesseract is what it sounds like. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I don't know if they're still online. I remember finding them years ago, but I haven't looked recently. Well, that uh, will be part of my long list of life goals to try and think well in 3D okay. um, based on my ignorance of the spatial reasoning and, and the things you've been talking about. I've just been assuming that I've been thinking in 3D. Um, so I will need to introspect more a little bit with that. Uh, another Origami, point. origami. Ooh, yeah, there you go. And, um, and there's a whole <laughs> mathematics now around origami and there's um, there's fashion, Ise Miyake. Well, you mentioned topology okay. also, so that may be you know origami topo I mean, I'm trying to I'm trying to tap into my creative side a bit more, so maybe that will be uh, an avenue that I would have to explore. You brought up the forcing kids to write left-handed in certain cultures. Of course, uh, I'm against any dogmatic enforcement without any alternative, but I assume that teaching these kids to, well, forcing, teaching them to write left-handed could be helpful in terms of adaptation or even within spatial reasoning, perhaps they could benefit from it. Um, so maybe we could use that beneficially, obviously don't force kids, that's, that's weird, but I could see perhaps <laughs> a benefit um, to something like that. Just I mean encouraging, you know? There's a but forcing them puts them at an extreme distance. Yeah, no, don't force them. Don't it, force it, them. And yeah. their left hand, it's very unlikely that th their right hand, if they're left handed, will ever get as dexterous as, mm. as their um, left hand is. So it's putting them at extreme disadvantage. Interesting. In okay. Systems. And you know the handedness doesn't necessarily correlate with footedness. So soccer players may be right-handed and left-footed. And again, try it's good to learn to bat left-handed or right-handed mm -hmm. to use your tennis racket in both ways. Um, so you right. do develop a skill set. But and if something happens to one hand, you have the other. But it, it's. It's very, very, very unlikely. That's where I was leaning. But yeah, I guess there potentially could be more disadvantages um, in terms of the, the dextrosity or the dexterity, whatever the word is that you yeah, use. Dexterity. Um, yeah. um, and so, you also like, mentioned, yeah, no, go, go for it. No, oh. no, no, you're fine. You're fine. Well, I was you just going to say you were talking about ambidextry. ambidextry yeah, you're ambidextry. right. Yeah, yeah. And perhaps some uh, adaptability that may come along with it. But there's pros right. and cons to everything. And you mentioned visual thinking, which could help us with abstract concepts. And I uh, I guess I, I wanted to mention that as uh, part of the, 
the 2D and 4D and 13D. Again, again, our physics, we're, we're physics nerds. So like <laughs> some string theory apparently has nine dimensions or 13 or what, whatever the it's heck 11, it is. 11. 11. So, yeah. um, but, uh, no, your um, questions were great, buddy. I mean, yeah. um, it's, it's, I, she has pretty much convinced me that the fundamental nature of reasoning seems to be spatial. I mean, I can see that. I can see, uh, <laughs> well, I don't know if it's purely spatial. Um, that, that is, I mean, we only have you for so long, but that would be up for debate for me. I think linguistics, of course, where some people think it's purely linguistics. I don't think that's the case. Perhaps it's like, uh, two sides of the same coin type thing where it's spatial and linguistics, or maybe there's a third thing, you know, the, the temporal, uh, reasoning that we incorporate, um, but, but linguistic, temporal, yeah. temporal reasoning is very much based on spatial. Right. Yep. We, we Absolutely. Say, we use the same words before and after, and and mm -hmm. there's some nice research by Lara Boroditsky showing that the spatial is primary. That um, spatial can affect temporal reasoning, but temporal, when you bias temporal reasoning, it doesn't really affect spatial. Okay. It's yeah. a complicated set of studies, but um, her work does show that the, the spatial is primary, although there are philosophical arguments on that, too. That's my no. domain, yeah, the it philosophical. Is, <laughs> it is hard to separate them. And earlier, um, Thomas, you asked about motion in space, and I yes. talked about the rats and the place cells and the grid cells, and I should say, add, that they are established by the motion of the rats. They're highly tied Amazing. to the little feet that are scampering here and there, yeah. and they're highly tied to the time. Not so those, space. not the grid cells, what are the other ones? Not the grid cells, place but cells. the play Both. cells. Both. Do the, are, are those constantly changing, like constantly just changing and new maps are being created? Do they stay the yes. same? or? Okay. And that is interesting, too. So if you take the rat out of the one environment, put them into another environment, the same set of, of play cells and grid cells are reused. Mm. So they're a bit like a blackboard or a whiteboard. They get right. wiped clean. So they are temporary in that sense. Yeah. And they're being used at the moment and then they'll be reused. They, are, they don't end up being permanent. But there are permanent, more permanent ways of linking um, places in space and mm -hmm. ideas in conceptual networks. Yeah, um, like a... Certainly, that's why I said that, that these spatial, temporal, conceptual relations are going to be broadcast and yeah. appear in many areas of the brain. Nice. And, yeah. No, that's that's fantastic. I love hearing you explain this stuff. Uh, Perry, we're going to give Dickie one chance, but I'm going to get you back in here. Uh, Barbara, how much longer do we have you for? I don't well, want to hold you. We're already at, at, at an, an hour. hour. I would okay. imagine your guests um, don't have, have other things to do. Yeah, absolutely. Well, um, I tell you what, it's been an hour. So, guys, uh, Dickie, I'm gonna let you in, but just be real quick with a question. If we can't find the question, we're gonna have to move on. Okay, bud. Let's get you in here real quick for Dr. Barbara. Hey, uh, thanks for taking my call. Well, Barbara, hey man, what's up? A, I am a uh, a mnemonics enthusiast, not really a protect or pro protection, whatever. Um, I was wondering if mnemonics was something that uh, you studied anybody with mnemonics in your uh, research, or if that even was brought up? Sure. Um, it, we know one mnemonic trick is to make images from language. And so if you're hearing language, make images or sets of images that are interrelated, and that will help you remember. So it's a general sort of thing, having two codes, visual and verbal. If you add to that gestural, a motor code, spatial motor code, you'll remember better. So, but there's a famous mnemonic device, which is called the method of loci, 
locus is place in Latin, and lo, loci is the plural. And this was used by the Roman orators to remember their long speeches, which they, wow. which any Latin student goes to great effort to translate. Mm. Um, and they were beautiful speeches and, and very complicated. So the way they remembered them, uh, ostensibly, this was taught to them, was to imagine themselves walking through the market. So the market also had temples and bankers and so forth. It means walking through the center of town and people would take a, a standard walk and at each place, locus, they would remember one part of the speech. They would associate mm. it with that place. Mm. And then as they were speaking, they would imagine going through the market at each of these places. And the visual images of each of these places were associated with that part of the speech. And that would help them remember. And interestingly, there was a Father Ricci who in the 14th century went to China with the goal of, of, of converting the Chinese. At that point, the Chinese were so far advanced <laughs> of, of Europe in everything, engineering, art, science, you name it. But they were very intent on learning and teaching. And even then, government administrators went through a series of exams to get accepted into the government to be an administrator and students studied for those exams. So the one gift that, that, that um, Ricci gave to the Chinese was the method of loci. And that they didn't know, and because it helped them remember, um, they were pleased to um, learn that. So he, that. he didn't end up converting them. I think he ended up becoming quite Chinese but um, he did give them the method of Loshe. There's a lovely book called The Memory Palace that recounts that story. Yeah, I, I have heard of The Memory Palace. Yeah, mnemonics is a, a heck of an interesting topic, Dickie. Thank you for asking that. We're going to let our, our guest go because she's probably got other things to do. <laughs> Thank you, Barbara, so much for coming. I love you. I love talking to you. Um, anytime you ever want to come back, please come back. We always... We always want to hear from, from you and people who have your kind of expertise. Thank so, you so much. And thank yes. you for your questions and for your interest. Thank you so much. All right. If you need any help anytime uh, on the on the getting in here or anything, just let us know. Thank you. Thank Bye -bye. you, honey. Bye-bye. Bye. All right, Perry. Are you here, Perry? Hello, Perry. Perry, you left me. Well, everyone, that was the show. It was a good, good show. Um, if Perry's not coming back, we may have to. Oh, he's back. Yeah, I'm back. <clears throat> Sorry. <laughs> uh, that was great. Um, Barbara was really nice and kind, and she explained. She even dealt with my interruptions because I interrupted her like five times. So she's really a good person. Seems like. <clears throat> yes, very well. Um, yeah very well spoken about mm -hmm. about these topics mm -hmm. <clears throat> the, fact, the fact that she knew exactly the uh the, the cooperation test or experiment that i was talking about was was amazing to me she knew exactly what i was talking about that's really cool huh? uh and that and that is and that is one of the things that happened you know the the guy would bump against the 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 doors and the baby would see him bumping against the doors and the baby would walk over there and open the door. And, mm -hmm. you know, that's with no language whatsoever. However, you could say that the baby had body language or the man, you know, the baby read the man's body language or whatever. I mean, I, I don't know, but, but it doesn't seem, it doesn't seem like it, it's the spatial does seem first. Remember the floating man we always like to talk about Barry? Mm -hmm. mm. See, how would he have spatial reasoning? Or well, spatial. my my main conclusion with with the floating man is that there is no experience. I don't see how there can be experience um, without the empirical. 
uh, I can perhaps be dishonest with myself and try and make some visual abstract where he's perhaps omniscient. I mean, maybe he's omniscient. I don't, maybe that would uh, answer the question. Um, but it does come down to a thing of almost a priori, which I tried to prevent. I tried to prevent saying that word for whatever reason, but you know, Kant and his space and time a priori and stuff. Uh, um, we, we have those innately and perhaps the baby has an a priori also to open the door when, they, you know, maybe there's some a priori there is the point that I'm trying to get to. Um, that would be my philosophical reasoning, uh, which perhaps doesn't match up with the scientific reasoning, of course. But um, yeah, she was very well spoken. She know she cites her sources. Uh, um, obviously, like I said earlier, I'm a novice, so that was uh, that was awesome hearing all that stuff. Yeah, I can hear you. Yeah. Yeah. No, like. Uh, uh, no, you're good. Can we have? Can a can the toddler that did that have any body language understanding from that adult? Like, I, I assume that that is what gave the baby the cue that there was a problem. Is that the person was bumping into the doors? Right. Which would be body language. I don't know how Barbara would think about that. Uh, she would probably argue that it's at its base spatial. Um, I don't yeah, know. Yeah, I man. mean, it it that would actually be my you know primary answer is it, the baby is seeing it empirically rather than there being some a priori notion to that somehow tells the baby to open the well, door. No, I mean, it is pro co cooperation is programmed into us, but so is competition. It's one of those two sides of the same coin kind of thing. I mean, cooperation is bred into us because of survival. We survive better when we cooperate rather than when we com co uh, combat each other, obviously. Mm -hmm. So that is built into our genetics, at least for, since the plains of Africa, I would assume. Um, so is there some, you know, like generative grammar, is there some kind of, is there some kind of spatial model that allows people to spatially reason? You know, it's just a model that's programmed in there by, you know, programmed, programmed in there by evolution, right? You following me? Yep. What do you think? Well, I just have trouble differentiating, I guess, the spatial reasoning with just pure empiricism. Um, I mean, we only have the idea of spatial reasoning through seeing or I'm not even seeing, I guess, like the blind uh, lady. Yep, you remember um, that. Yep. Um, man, it's so hard. I, well, you guys did mention how there is this like innate helpfulness amongst humans. Um, so that could be the reasoning for, for the baby helping. Um, yeah. It just seems like spatial reasoning is another word for... Em empiricism. I mean, I I, I, I well, really don't know how else to, to say it. With, empiricism has to do with spatial reasoning, but it's not all there is to empiricism because right, you have yeah, to be able to hear things and smell things and taste things, right? So, so can you? I guess, have... I guess you could argue that that smell is spatial, right? Because exactly. Does, yeah. Yeah. So I don't know what sen olfactory senses, ocular senses. I don't know which one of those isn't spatial, right? I think there. I think an argument could be made that they're all spatial, even taste. I think that perhaps you can. Uh, it's so difficult. It's such diff That's maybe a hard not one. taste. I don't. I don't know yeah, how I don't we know about taste. that one to ourselves. That taste. What about is, hearing, uh, though? What about hearing? Like, uh, like an echo. I mean, echoes. Yeah, I mean perhaps? space. I mean, you have to have space to create a sound. A sound can't be made with no space. So yeah. True. True. A sound is movement of air particles which is space so. now what are we missing hearing taste a smell can you smell 
is spatial reasoning conducted through smell? You, if you were blind and deaf, you could probably smell your way around a room to where it didn't smell so bad in one place. Unless it was an even smell the entire room, then it would just be normal to you. Mm. The more potent a smell is could lead you to believe that it's a smaller space since you're That's smelling correct. it easier. That's yeah. correct. So smell and taste are weird ones. I don't know if... Smell. Peter says smelly space theory. Come on up here, Peter, and tell us about smelly space theory. Smelly space theory. Come on, Peter. Peter's on to something. Peter's on to something. I knew it. Ooh, Jason's here. Paul's here. <gasps> Jack's here. Jack. Jack Malak. Yeah, we're in, uh, we're in freelance, free roam. Yeah, we're in free roam it. time, guys. We're just free riding. Peter. What are you doing, mate? Um, I'm not. I just got in the door here. So. I'm, uh, yeah, I'm just contemplating smelly, smelly space theory. <laughs> I mean, look, look at if we, if the air, if we keep on going with this global warming, we're just going to end up just like the sun, except smellier. <laughs> <laughs> I get a drink. Be back in a minute. All, All right, right get a drink, Jack. 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 Yo. He's not going to answer. He's, give, he's giving up. He's on, he's, he's on no, his video. No, it's it's like that. What up? What up? I patch. What? I know, right? Is it still using this one? One second. Switch. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> when you started to look at it, it was really funny. <laughs> I was telling Jack that the first time that I saw him, I actually thought that he only had one eye. And I thought that the eye patch was like a real. A few radio shows. It made me laugh. It's just so much hiss. I can't fuck. I got the beer horn. What'd you think, Jack? You get to listen to most of that? Can you hear it through your right eye? I was goofing off on another tap for a while. But I got to listen to it. I got to listen to it pretty good. good. The spatial bit of that is uh, interesting. Uh, uh, she's made a good, pretty good case to me. I mean, like, language is necessary, obviously. Perception. That's what, well, what's, that's what you've heard me and Perry talking about it. So what's your take on that? Do you think it's just spatial as the foundation level of uh, def definitely thinking? Well, no. Or is the vision, you know, she talks about <laughs> visual thinking, too. So no, that's, I, I guess that's what I, she I, I, a, at a show, which is bullshit, mm -hmm. and then I had a couple Overall, of a it makes sense some that who can play music and once we started to develop senses and anything other like after we started moving when we started developing senses, it makes of, sense uh, what, for what all of our it? senses to work that perception within the space that, that we've started to learn how to sense so that's just that, that just right off the bat that just sounds logical <laughs> like a like the okay. logical path to follow when coming to this stuff so uh <laughs> yeah Taste is the only one that's kind of is a little bit difficult. Yeah, to what would be spatial like, about yeah. taste? I mean, could you, you could obviously lick something and tell what it was shaped like, I imagine, but you wouldn't want to do that. Right? Actually, uh, sorry, you, yeah. oh, wait, no, licking would you be have touch. The licking would be touch. I'm sorry, taste would... Yeah, you touch. have the ability to... Um, is it a, a spatial taste? So it, it depends on how, like, really, like, crazy you want to go about it, right? <laughs> now... Yeah. Now, now, like, if you get real nutty about this, like, if you really take it out as far as you can, if you know enough about the area you're in and you taste, yes, like, that's what I was going to say, dung or some dirt, you could tell what animals have been in the space before by taste, <clears throat> and and what's like you, like you would have to do samples, of course. But yes, there's a way to use space. To some old huntsmen like walking taste. around, smelling trees and licking trees and stuff. Yes. Essentially, yeah, that's that's it's, it's, it's a you can use taste to inform yourself about like uh, at least the uh, the area that the uh, that you know the taste effect. So it's like you go up to taste like a like bush or something like that. The entire the, the spatial property of the bush, like the spatialness of the bush, is like either good or bad. Your taste buds, and so you're like, okay, this entire area for like you know when it comes to the subject of taste is bad. This is a bad spot. That's it's a bad area. Say. Let's go completely reductio ad absurdum here. Let's just go as far as. Let's say you only have taste. Could you figure out spatial thinking? Ooh, good one. Only taste. Yes, because yes, yes, you can because you can taste the air, and uh, you could tell if the area around you was dry or wet. Uh, you could. That's probably tell, true. Yeah. 
you could tell if uh, the ground is like uh, if the ground is uh, dry or wet as well. You could tell what kind of um, stuff is on the ground. Like you know, you taste like some dirt, or if you taste grass, <laughs> or if you taste snow, or if you taste uh, you know you know any any other different type of those things. There's a way that you can use uh, taste to discover your spatial area. Actually, snakes specifically use their tongues to detect uh, not only like prey but everything about their environment. Yeah, aren't they, they like blind the for the most part? Uh, no, just really shitty eyesight. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> not blind, but not like for the yeah, most part. Yeah. Hold up, Peter's completely. trying to get in, guys. Go, Peter. <laughs> They're all snakes on there, Peter. It's a pit of snakes, Peter. Can you hear through your right eye? Yes, you can. Look at that. It'd be weird if you took your eye patch off and you just had a socket there. Right. <laughs> no, no, no. Is it a, there's probably an eye underneath here. <laughs> did you have a did you have a did you have a concert tonight, Peter? There you go. Good job. <laughs> Depth perception? Oh, okay. <laughs> That's silly. That's silly as fuck. Oh my God, Peter! <laughs> so Perry. No, you're good, Pete. Pete, I love it. I think it's fucking great, Perry. What you Yo. got in your mouth? Uh, THC. Me too. That's exactly Damn. what I'm doing. Now, nah, come to think about it. Oh, this is this, uh, this is. Are you, is it your? Are you uploading this? You're not, are you going to cut this back end of it? Yes, I'll, I'll cut this back. Yeah. I'll cut oh, this okay. Back. I didn't know if you were gonna. Yeah, I didn't know if you were gonna end it like right yeah, as soon as I'll you said it. Like, I'll cut it. Yeah. Okay. I'm not gonna. <laughs> I'm not gonna. Well, that's the case. Well, I just did. I was gonna. Smoke weed. Oh, Jack, gonna we'd hate. Same, we'd hate for people to see you smoke smoking. weed. Oh no, we can't have that. Well, I'll that on the YouTube, unfortunately. <laughs> oh yeah, that's right. Because doesn't YouTube <laughs> yeah, okay. prohibit cannabis well, use? YouTube, okay, so like, so actually, funny thing is, Thomas can't smoke weed on YouTube, but I can smoke weed on YouTube. Because you're in a legal state. Yeah. Yeah. That's the that's like the shittiest thing. And and I just did I still and even then, like, it's on his channel and then if they felt like striking it, they'd have to go through some sort of bullshit to try and confirm. Like it's it's just it's dumb. So I didn't want to like smoke up until Let's we smoke got the triophonic. <clears throat> what if you have your med card in a state that isn't legal? Oh well you have your med card, it's legal for you, then therefore it's okay. So you could post it on YouTube? Uh, yeah. If yeah, gotcha. There used to be um, but the but I'll be I'll be uh, honest. The algorithm is not very strong with it because uh, there used to be like a lot more weed tubers. Like, oh, I used to watch so many YouTube but like weed videos. Yeah, they like sliced it. They just chopped it up. It's like very few people are able to do that now and like get away with it as like a big channel. Dude, I used to watch this guy take like the fattest dabs <laughs> of all time or fattest bong rips. I forget what his name was, but. Dude, is that why they're going away, Jack? Because I noticed that that a long time ago, like there were a shitload of YouTube channels that were like popular and getting a lot of views, and it was all about smoking. And now those don't those aren't around anymore. Yeah, the There's, algorithm pretty much the algorithm's like I have the algorithm, but I frowned upon yeah. this, and then you know now it won't. Same reason I can't find funny videos from like twelve years ago. So. Oh yeah, no, oh man, there's, there's still uh... motherfucking YouTube <laughs> have everything. YouTube should have everything that's ever been up on YouTube. They shouldn't be deleting shit. God damn it. I, I think it's really great that they're like, oh, wow, you know this thing that propelled me to greatness? All of these things that, like, drove intense amount of viewers and shit to my fucking profile? I'm just going to go ahead and say fuck all of you because I've gotten too I big for my britches. I've got <laughs> <laughs> I'm fishing. What is it, Peter? I thought you were about to say something. Oh, you sh- okay. 
it. Does it still say that Barbara's uh, on the she's panel? Still here. For you guys? Well, she's listening. Yeah, that's okay. okay. I was just gonna say it'd be funny if she just hopped on camera and she was smoking a bowl or something. Oh, bad. <laughs> That would be a, that would be surprising. It'd be, it'd be, it'd be most it'd be, of the time. Yeah, I mean, if she if she's listening, Barbara, we love you. We're just as, a bunch uh, of yeah, that's a great sorry show. about degeneracy. Uh, yeah. <laughs> don't, don't mind our degeneracy. <laughs> this, this weed helps our spatial reasoning. Trust me. <laughs> One could say it gives me access to a whole other dimension. Yes. I mean, really, <laughs> she really, she really changed my ideas about, you know how a priori reasoning comes about, you know, me and up Perry always thought you can't have reasoning without language, but I mean, you can't have reasoning without some kind of empirical spatial something as well. Yep. That so, comes first. You know, it's, you know, it's imagine that, that, that is probably foundational. You know what I think is interesting is I think it's interesting the process of which, like which senses essentially got to be like the most dominant because they were the most useful. Like how many, yeah, other it, senses, it, it, how many evolution other senses didn't give have? a good God. Evolution doesn't give a good goddamn about giving us what the perfect tools to represent reality are. It gave us the best user interfaces that we could have to deal with the data that we get. Like exactly, you know, our senses are dumbasses. You know what I mean? Like they're all stupid as fuck. So. They're fallible, yeah, for sure. Yeah, think it's about all the redundancies that, like, uh... that we have in, in our brain and our body that are just wastes of evolution. Like breathing and eating out of the same hole, or. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, you know, the, the storage unit is right uh, next to the luxury unit. Having having your waste come out of the play factory as well. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's more of a you issue. I would, but... I would say there's a lot of. Uh... <laughs> yeah, Perry. That yeah, I get it, Perry. <laughs> yeah, there's a, yeah, there's a lot of uh, <laughs> unfortunate like things about evolution, like especially as it comes to like genitals and stuff like. You know, I know it's getting a little crazy, but, but testicles most... do not need to exist outside of the body. That, dude, I swear that's what I was about to say. Why put that shit? Why not put that shit in the middle of me, like in the very the center, most defended the area part of my rib cage? You know? <laughs> <laughs> well, just, what would you crazy. rather have? Where the fucking heart is. You know? Yeah. What I mean? Well, not what would you there. rather have? A heart or a dick? And you'd rather have a, a heart. heart. Obviously, I'm, I can right. I can live without a dick. I can't so there's there's only, there's only so much space. I mean, I guess I guess what no, you're hold asking second, hold is second. you're telling me you're telling me right now that there's no way we could find space. I disagree. I disagree that like there wasn't a way that we could have just like curved out a little well, bit on our hips and I had think... that space. Like that that's bullshit. Universe. Well, I mean, I, I, if 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 we are intelligently designed, then yes, I do believe that, Jack. Oh God! But I I think the fact that since we're probably not, and we did come from some natural selected thing, we need space for our nerves. I mean, do you know how many miles our blood vessels stretch it's out to? Like hundreds, isn't it? It, it goes like, around. It goes around, it goes around the Earth. I mean, that's all got to fit in to this. Miles, I think. Wait, what? Yes, search it up. Search up if you were to. I don't know about the planet. Hold on. I'm pretty sure it's the planet. More. Well, actually, it's more than that. That's around the world twice. Yes. So (laughs) there's there's not a lot of. So you were actually. So I was right. There's no way it was around the planet once. Fuck yeah! There's no way. (laughs) Oh yeah, that was your intent for sure. Yeah, (laughs) that was that was my intent. Well, you know, Thomas, I was surprised when she said that humans have trouble spatially reasoning in 3D. Yeah. I I thought I was doing that the whole time. No, okay. I mean, like, a lot of people look, have look, 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 sixty thousand miles, oh baby. Hang on, yeah. people, people it's like crazy. us who have trained ourselves to think in three dimensional abstractions, yes. But okay. most people aren't thinking in three dimensional abstractions. Like, close your eyes right now and sure. think of a palace. Think of a palace with with corridors and a big open room when you first walk in, and it has all these other rooms. You can abstract that as a three dimensional object, right? Yeah, yeah, of course. Okay. Some people can't. But yeah, it's what, the, what, it's the, it's the rotating apple, man. Like so, like yes, it's spinning. Yeah, it's the rotating the rotating apple. Like miles of blood apple your head, by the way. Make it yes, as good as you it's... possibly can, and then start spinning it, and then spin it in a counterclockwise direction. It, yeah, spin, you're now in now, now, now spin it. Yeah. yeah, now spin it. Yeah, spin it omnidirectionally, and then make a clone of it. You know what I mean? Some people can't even get close to spinning the apple omnidir- omnidirectionally. Like they it does. Even get Okay, so I was spinning the palace okay. when Thomas was telling me to do that. Can you yeah. do it with while it's static though, without it spinning? 
can you think palace? yeah yeah right yeah i can too so i mean I, i'm just confused as to i guess i mean i'm not someone else so i don't have the experience of someone else but i i, I wonder what is so <laughs> difficult about um this is, this is conceiving the idea no, I don't think it's about um I don't think it's about difficulty. I really think it's just about like ability. Like somebody somebody's mind just isn't there enough to bear like it isn't right there for that type of thinking. Can they get there like, at some point through training? I don't know. I don't know if the part's possible actually. Was it um okay. I do know that like if you if you put an apple in front of someone and they're looking at it and you tell them think about that apple, they can think about and hold on to the image that their eyes saw of the apple. But if you tell them to spin it or to rotate it or anything, that becomes impossible. They can't hold on to that anymore because they're they're like messing with it. Right. It, well, by the way, Perry, there is Apple now hmm. at the moment. It's, it's yeah, <laughs> yeah, Peter. There is crap. <laughs> <laughs> by the way, Perry, what the hell is thinking in four dimensions? I mean, that's insane. That would be like. So yeah. t- remember, a, a two a, we three dimensional creatures look at a wall and see it as a two dimensional thing, right? But a four-dimensional thing would look at that wall and see a three-dimensional thing. So that doesn't yep. even make sense in our heads what that would be, right? That's, That's why what I was. The four-dimensional hypercube with tesseract. I was hoping that she was going to address that. Um, Picturing a tesseract is almost hard enough. I mean, I try to just make it more complicated. But yeah, it's yeah. a square. The tesseract is a square in which each side of the square wall is a three-dimensional object. Yeah. Right. So, well, okay. So what I would do, and I wonder if this is what you just said, but I'll, I guess I'll explain it in my language. Again, it, uh, moving is an axiom, we'll say, that you ha- you, it has to be moving in order to try and conceptualize it. I, I have trouble doing it while it's static. So it's moving. I look at the corner of my wall right now. Um, I'd show you if my phone was working with the camera. But you can think of a corner of a wall, and while you're moving towards it, there is another uh, perpendicular surface amongst the wall that is moving in and out. Essentially, in and out of existence is what it would look like. So it's moving in and out of existence as you're coming closer and farther away from the wall. Um, That's how I would picture the 4D type of thing where there's another surface that is coming in and out of existence. Of course it's not. I mean, um, if the, if, if 40 is a real thing, then, you know, it is existing always, but you'd perceive it as though it were not blipping, but just smoothly coming in and out of existence. Uh, well, yeah, go for it. Are, are we looking at like the, the fourth dimension as we picture just like the, uh, the ability for all the things in the third dimension to, go through change and like the fourth dimension is time in that sense. Like the fourth dimension is like the, the thing that moves along in the third dimension that allows for the things in the third dimension to go through change. Mm, interesting. And so it, the, the fourth dimension is a preliminary necessity in order for the 3d to even move or change or cause or do anything. I would, interesting. Yeah, that, yeah. That makes that, that for some reason, yeah, they're, they're like mm. spanked into my head right now. Well, that is more or less what I mean. We live in a 4D world, according to to many scientists, where it's three dimensions of space, one dimension of time. So it's almost like that dimension of time could be this this dimension of causing. I don't know. Is perhaps how, well, how it's, it's it. a, well, yeah, because well, well, without time, you're stuck in a like a drawing, I guess. Yeah, static 3D models of representation. Yes. And then the second you add time to it, it's all capable of going through some version of change. So time's got to be like the field of like on which like three dimensional objects like, like move on or play on essentially. Like it goes like, it's what these things like go through. Like, you know, essentially it's like, uh, Oh, like how people have said in the past, like a fabric that's woven into like every piece of matter or whatever that allows it to move and go through changes throughout like that, this, time let me just hog the mic for one more question on that is time an uncaused cause in that sense or can time have could there be a fifth dimension that could cue in the time dimension which cues in our 3d dimension um or can time be an uncaused cause 
as it seems right now, I don't have an answer because what I would what I believe to be the case, and I don't actually have any like imperial. This just makes sense to me, and I don't have. There's no evidence for this, but <laughs> I think that our universe, in the way that it is, was it being the way the I think the multiverse exists. Our universe was created inside of a grander timeline. So that would be like the fifth quote unquote dimension to that. Uh, what mm-hmm. you're saying, I it see. Would be the, and uh, it would have popped off from there, starting its own exact timeline, where for that dimension, time would have just started. Mm-hmm. Versus yeah, well, time of course... continuously going on in a greater set of dimensions right. that, uh, that exactly. birthed it out within the multiverse. That's like the. <laughs> and I, I imagine just, so time could be. Could I, be I don't know for sure, sure though. Yeah, could be, I don't think time could be very multi-universal. Just Multiple universe, yeah. It, yeah. it just could be something that <clears throat> that's it's an. You know, intrinsic to all what we came before and what will come after, like you know. Yep, it could. Oh, well, that's what shit. I mean. I guess by the uncaused. Because one thing cause, has to happen right? after another. Time has to exist for a big bang to to occur in the first place. If yeah, you know, that's what I'm saying. I think that the I think that our time got started by or in outside of our universe by, by the sort of like the multiverse essentially, and when our time got started, it started, did it? Yeah. What what's yeah so what started, the started, original started big would be relative to, started would be relative oh, to the space. Yeah, we're back to square one here, you know. No, no, yeah, no. Started would be relative to the space in which it was born out of from the uh, the larger set of universes. But uh, yeah, no, it, it, all it brings you back is unfortunately a uh, uh, it's a kind bigger of big bang. Infinite, yeah, it goes. It just goes into infinite. Yeah. Yeah. Like uh, Lord God's there, going. There, there, I'm pissed off with creating angels. What am I going to do? I'm going to. You know what? A, a great idea. Check this out. <laughs> We're all going, how's it going? Yeah. Well, what, the universe going? going? Yeah, it's, it's, it's going good. You know, you, you know, you have a few intelligent things like I'm fucking. Oh, yeah. Like, uh, there's a few I things happen. You know, it, it's, 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 we it's can go over. Right? Hey, I found a really good source on uh, Scientific American if you want to go over the nine types of multiverses. What every object <laughs> Nine types. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. But what every That sounds interesting. I can do that. Nine, nine theoretical. If well, I to experience, go ahead and call it. What it is. Let me. I want to answer. Um, I want to answer Spitfire in the comments. Right oh, now. I'm sorry. Go ahead. That's Jason. No, you're good. Yeah, is it? Uh, oh, Jason. Yes. Yeah, so he says, uh, but would every object subvert to change? Uh, subvert to change inherently experience it differently. So I think the only things that would matter when it comes to experience are things that have the cognitive ability to experience it. So you can cut out like 99. percent or like 99.9% of all matter that ever existed. And when it comes to what it can experience, I think that it, I think that because we have minds and our minds take in a reality that we have a subjective view of, then inherently they all will experience change differently. Some people's like idea of change will probably be really similar, but it would take something with cognition in order to experience. So that's, that's kind of where that would, would go there. So was it? Uh, D- I read what Detro said. Detro, thumbs up to you, sir. No time or space can. Thumbs up. Thumbs up. In the universe. Yeah. So first, it doesn't matter. There wouldn't be. Okay. Mm, interesting. If we're not oh, thinking, hold, hold, hold on a second. Wait, 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 wait. I was just going because, to tell Perry, don't think philosophically on this one. Let's just be scientists. <laughs> yeah. No. I, that, that is that is how I uh, I read it at first because yeah yeah yeah. You know, uh, just, yeah, just because you're not capable of uh, measuring whether or not something is there just yet or not. Yeah, but uh, so the, the, the existence of matter requires time. That's, that's it. The existence of matter, does, I don't think so. I think as far as, as far as like the existence our, of matter requires time. Oh, the existence of matter. Well, the exist. Yeah, the existence of matter does require time. Yes, time does not require matter. Yeah, matter like so. Time. So, time time is not something that can be. It's kind of like the same thing.
No, I mean like even in that rock there are there are virtual particles and there are anti matter and antimatter and there's there's all different like glows gluons and bosons and quarks and fermions and leptians le fermions and leptons and stuff. They're all changing states constantly. So a, a, a a lack of any quantum state change in the universe would be absolute zero, which would be no time. Actually, that's right. Hold on a second. I'm thinking I'm remembering something now. You're good. Hold on. So, like, Divorce. my understanding of how we take time now is that if a quantum state changes to something else, like an electron appears on this side of the atom and then appears on that side, the change in states is what we would call time. Mm -hmm. if you want to get down to the very nitty gritty of it, you could also go classical. Well, yeah, because it's just it's say, just things changing. Well, states, no, so. real, real quick, real quick, you could also go classical mechanics and say the change from one thing to the next, or you know, a sequence of events is time. If you just wanted to say that, it's not always existed. I'm not trying to say that time has always existed. I'm saying that the time was just around before matter was. I'm not saying it was. I didn't say time. time. Matter. I'm not saying time always existed. That's not at all what I'm saying. There had to be like there had there had to be like whatever it was you know whatever the however the multiverse creates new fucking universes <laughs> had to happen in order for this timeline to exist in the first place time in this universe wasn't happening before that Neither so was... okay real quick the best thing I can find of what we're just talking about is the concept of time is intimately connected to the existence of matter and energy in the universe so it does not make sense to speak of time existing before matter. It's only because if 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 you if uh, if they want to classify energy as matter to make it easier because it's only it's like that in two different states if we're just calling it matter then fine I guess that works <laughs> I'll se I separate I separate energy and matter because that's fucking retarded because I would love to see anybody take a fuck ton of energy and create matter right now do it uh, like would, are we ever gonna have the capability of just smacking energy into a fucking so physical so I looked this up the other day and I wrote it down it's uh. A I don't question. Think it has to exist it's space a, and time have to exist together because we because does special relativity together. indicate? It says does special relativity indicate that matter and energy are the same? And uh, uh, the the article says yes. Special relativity implies that matter and energy are two aspects of the same thing, which is referred to as the mass energy field. So that, that's, that's that's not so. Right. I, that's that's no. That's fine. I just think it's really. I, I just think it's it's like oh, well, it's just fuck it. Well. If you're calling matter, why, lazy why, why, why give it two different names? Other, why give it two different names other than being like, oh well, this is this is this when it's still, and this is this when it's moving, or like not still, but like way slower, essentially. It's probably <laughs> easier to think of energy as an intrinsic property of mass to do to be able to do work. That's probably the best way to think about it. No, that's fine. It's just I don't like that. It's such a weird thing to connect. It. Like space time makes a sense of the connection, energy and matter. Matter. So l l let me explain this. One, one of the key principles in special relativity is like the laws of physics are like the same in all inertial reference frames, like movement frames. So that means that there is no preferred reference frame for measuring any physical phenomenon. So hold on a second, hold on a second. Empty your mind. Okay, then, no, then, then uh, and if that's if, if that's the case, that's fucking fine. I can see where that's at now. Because if okay, if energy came first, but then the bullshit. Okay, I, I see where I see where it's at now. I, I know where my thoughts were. I was just a little fucking thrown off. That's where. Take off the bats, man. I just no. want people watching to get the right <laughs> info. No, 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 no. It makes sense. Energy came first, but then the fucking density and fucking. See, uh, it's such a. Mm, I find that it just fucking it sounds like fucking here. Let Peter get in. What's up, Peter? What's up, Peter? How can the energy exist without the time? Uh, yeah. well, that's energy what it was just saying. fucking did. Yeah, it, that, it, that... <laughs> energy, energy requires time, and time requires energy. The, it that's... Seems like the two are inter. Locked. That's what we were saying a minute ago. Is that that time and matter are are pretty much interrelated, in, in intrinsically, and That's that right. mass and energy are the same is there thing. There's a difference between a sequence of events. Special relativity. Yes. Well, if you think a sequence of events is different sets of changes, then no. I think if you lived on Jupiter for five hundred years and you came back to, Ar to Ireland. <laughs> You probably see all your your relatives about like five years older than you. 
Um, if that's Maybe actually not, like, then the gravity, like if that's what the guy, that's how hard gravity warps time on fucking <laughs> Jupiter, fuck it out. But uh, if you, yeah, yeah, I was wondering if you lived on Jupiter, it behave having you more mass, would you, you a, age at a slower rate than someone on Earth who has a lesser mass? That's... Interesting question for another time. <laughs> All right, no, so no, no, it's, 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 I was just gonna say e equals mc square implies that the mass can be converted into energy and vice versa, and that the amount of energy released in a process such as nuclear fusion or fission is directly proportional to the amount of mass that is converted into energy. So that's why they say it's the same thing. That's why it's e equals mc squared. E being energy, M being this mass. This is an expanding okay, so because universe. Because once it's converted problem. into the other, it's the same thing. That's so, oh, that's interesting. Okay, sure. Yeah, I, I'm not. I, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. That sounds like it's just said for convenience sake, and that's fair. Well, it, look, look the, know, the, like, most, the most classic example is, uh, you know, stars. Bits of stars turn into other stars, and that's how we get the heavier metals. And that's how aware, things are becoming more complex yeah. as we go because we have more shit to work with. And um, that may that? not be a process that's entirely finished either. I don't know. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there, there may be crazy and, and the, 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 you know, know. Life forms like us, we're going to come a thing of the past, man. The matter exists. Oh, those old humans, that stuff they did. Did you ever check it out? Uh, five billion times as five, sorry, five billion years time, the sun won't be clever. What to in us. the hell is with this like? We have Detroit, to get off just, the just get in anyway. But it just... is if we manage to survive that long with you know, you can guarantee it multiple extinction five events billion years time. from now peter i don't think there's going to be any humans left looking at an exploding sun i'm cool being optimistic come on you're being you're being optimistic that will last five billion more years that's 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 very no no we're no that well it's it, well we have about five billion more years yeah the until the sun burns up and fucking supernovas yes well it does it won't won't supernova no mm. it, it'll be what it'll white dwarf white dwarf so then it'll just it's annihilate going the Caucasian thing. midget. It's going to go completely Caucasian midget on us. Sweet. And, uh, Let's fucking travel to the future and go to that point. See what it looks like. Earth probably won't well. look anywhere near the same. Wow. In five well, that, billion yeah. years, the, in five billion years, the Earth might be a fucking lava pit. Who knows? That's a long. Well, we will be. Earth, yeah, we're, 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 we're getting burned up. Here, here's something that that's that was proposed as well. Some of the, the moons of Jupiter may become habitable after the red giant because the red giant will not uh, extend for not too much further than the asteroid belt. Probably about a hundred million miles from fucking Jupiter, hmm. and uh, they were saying a lot of the moons could be, could become hab- habitable. <laughs> What happened beforehand? Mm-hmm. But uh, we're going to experience some seriously oh, severe global warming. Like, no, I uh, got back, yeah. back then, way back in about five billion years. I got one more fucking thing that just sounds stupid. I just, I just, I, I, I just want to make sure that it like fits in my head correctly. Because even though I sound like a dumbass right now, it just like a lot of the stuff just sounds fucking ridiculous the way that's got to be said. So. If it's the same as like if, if using it is interchangeable because they equal each other, then can I say squares and circles are interchangeable because they have the same amount of degrees when it comes to like fucking putting them together and shit like that when you come to measure it? Like 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 a fucking like you can, like, morph, you can like, morph a circle. I mean you can morph a circle into a square if you have that capability and it and it's a mal- right, but, but, but but are they the same thing? But are circles like our circle squares then like no, and it's are it's they extri- are they are they backwards and extricably yeah, linked with each other because they have a similar uh, property? <laughs> so, <laughs> like that's the, that's the only it's that's the, the only thing about it. It's it's not the best way to think about it because, ma- uh, um, special relativity it shows that mass and energy are like 
two uh, there are two manifestations of the same underlying entity, right? Uh, so if you take a system and you take the total mass energy of a system, um, then matter and energy is conserved for all physical processes. So let me read this. It says, this idea has been confirmed by numerous experiments and is a fundamental principle of modern physics. Mm-hmm. And this, uh, oh, that's right before I read you this one a minute ago. This equation implies mm-hmm. that mass. It wasn't can... about what, it's not about the trueness of this. 